so we are doing uh, search play the flies and uh, we almost finished uh, the first scene uh, today uh, we will look at scene 2 but before that uh, I just want to uh, read a few lines towards the end of the first scene uh, because here we find that uh, the change in Orestes uh, that takes place uh, is uh, described particularly through the eyes of uh, Electra. So Orestes uh, who was purposeless at the beginning uh, that has also been uh, depicted uh, very uh, thoroughly by Sartre uh, so that the contrast in Orestes from the earlier purposelessness to the later uh, determination becomes very clear. So here Electra looks at Orestes, this is on page 91, oh how you have changed, your eyes have lost their glow, they are dull and smoldering, I am sorry for that, Philebus, you were so gentle, but now you are talking like the Orestes of my dreams. So clearly the uh, two names Philebus and Orestes are used to uh, refer to the two different states of the same person. And uh, uh, strangely uh, Sartre depicts the later Orestes who finds his purpose in life as uh, somewhat losing the uh, you know, spark in his eyes. So the determination uh, to commit himself to a cause, particularly to the cause of uh, freedom, it would involve mindless violence ironically and therefore the later Orestes is depicted as one who is determined but who also appears to be mindless and dull. But that was the Orestes of Electra's dreams that is an Orestes who can take action, who would not hesitate. Listen, all these people quaking with fear in their dark rooms with their dear departed round them. Supposing I take over all their crimes. Supposing I set out to win the name of guilt stealer and heap on myself all their remorse. That of the woman unfaithful to her husband, of the tradesman who let his mother die, of the usurer who bled his victims white. Surely once I am plagued with all those banks of conscience, innumerable as the flies of Argos, surely then I shall have earned the freedom of your city. Shall I not be as much at home with, within your red walls as the red apron butcher in his shop among the carcasses of flayed sheep and cattle? So this uh, indicates that everybody has some reason for guilt. Everybody has been unjust to somebody. So in uh, Christian terms one would say that nobody is without sin. But Sartre is not using the Christian uh, paradigm here. But nevertheless uh, he points out that in the uh, business of everyday life we often commit injustice and we have to suffer the consequences for that. Therefore, to uh, take upon himself all their guilt, all their pangs of conscience, makes Orestes a Christ-like figure indeed, but that is not what is in Sartre's mind. Orestes is no Christ. And uh, that is made clear in the next pieces. Electra, so you wish to atone for us? To atone? No. I said I would house your penitence, but I did not say what I would do with all those cackling fowls. Maybe I will wring their necks. 
So Orestes is no Christ. He is not going to atone for the sins of others. But he says that I would take upon myself all the guilt of others and uh, commit an action for their freedom so that others become free. But the equation of sin and atonement do not come here. Why they do not come in here? Because Sartre constructs his play on the foundation of nihilism and existentialism. Neither of these thought systems believe in God or sin. Nihilism denies that there is anything good or evil. So if you do not believe in good or evil, if you do not believe uh, in, uh, then you do not believe in the question of justice or in the question of injustice or uh, in the question of sin and atonement. So all these are thrown out of our purview uh, when we base our plot on a nihilist foundation. The only redeeming feature in this play is the existentialist approach which affirms that in spite of the fact that there is no good or evil or so-called justice injustice. In uh, everyday life we are often uh, do we do often do things which are not right. So uh, what is not right? Operation and uh, we must free ourselves from this. So if we believe in operation, then we are actually believing in some kind of value. Because we are at least believing in operation and freedom. So we believe in some kind of value. That is the redeeming feature of existentialism. And because of this belief in freedom, that one is prompted to take action or to commit oneself to the cause of freedom. Therefore, even though Orestes does not believe in good and evil, yet he decides to kill Clytemnestra and uh, Egisthus. He says at one point, after the murder, that what I did was right. I did the right thing. So here we see that Sartre is working on razor's edge. It is a very tricky situation. You cannot believe both in nihilism and existentialism or any other kind of evil simultaneously. So the uh, the entire orientation of existentialism and its focus and its message becomes completely different if not opposed to that of nihilism. So existential in existentialism an existential hero takes a positive action, committed action, whereas a nihilist hero does not believe in anything, he may destroy everything, we do not know. And the fascist uh, audience of this play made this misinterpretation. They believed that Orestes stands for fascism, for uh, Nazism, which is largely based on uh, Nietzsche's nihilism. As we analyze the play, we see that Orestes is not a fascist hero or a nihilist hero. 
he is an existentialist hero. Okay, so this is a very moot point in the play, and that is why I am reading these lines in detail to understand how Sartre is walking on the razor's edge. He must uh, help his audience to understand the right interpretation. So he gives enough hints that Orestes is a redeemer or a deliverer. He, he would deliver the people of Argos from their oppression. He would uh, free them. Sartre gives all these hints when Orestes says that I am doing the right thing or I have done the right thing. But the hesitations and the uh, unuttered accusations of Electra in the matter of the twin murders, particularly in the matter of murdering uh, Clytemnestra. In those uh, hesitations or those uh, amusings, we may say, of Electra, she is giving voice to a criticism of destructive violence from some particular angle, say from an idealist point of view. All violence should be opposed. But violence is the dynamo of history, at least of human history. So there is no way that we can completely get rid of violence. We can only ensure that we use violence, if we have to use it, for the right cause. That is, we do not use violence for oppression, but we use it for freedom. So, soldiers joining, uh, you know, two sides of a war, if you think of the current war in Afghanistan, for example, both of them are using similar guns, similar rockets and so on, similar weapons. One of them, we say, are in the right and the other is in the wrong. But violence is there. Violence is endemic. Nobody can completely avoid violence. So in Electra's hesitation, which we will read thoroughly, we will see that she expresses her happiness after the murder of both Aegisthus and Clytemnestra, because she says that that is what I wanted. But we also see that when Orestes wanted to murder them, then she hesitated. <clears throat> Alright, so here there is no question of atonement, which means that it is not a question of, uh, you know, religion, it is not a question of uh, a paradigm of, you know, sin and atonement. And then Electra asks, and how can you take over our sense of guilt? Why? All of you ask nothing better than to be rid of it. Only the king and queen force you to nurse it in your foolish hearts. The king and queen, O Philobus. So, the implication is that Orestes wants to kill the king and queen because if they are not there, then the citizens, they will not nurture this sense of guilt. And uh, we see that Electra only expresses this, you know, kind of uh, you know, uh, fearful uh, expression, the king and queen. She is afraid that Orestes is going to kill them. The gods bear witness that I had no wish to shed their blood. Do we see a contradiction here? Orestes says that I do not wish to shed their blood. So the point is 
perhaps Orestes does not want to kill them. But will they stop playing their roles as oppressors of the people if they are not killed? That will not happen. They will not change themselves. And therefore there is no option left for all stress but to kill them. So in such antagonisms which uh, Marxists would say, you know, dialectical opposition of different forces, there is uh, no scope for change of heart. So change of heart is an idealist expression uh, which does not happen in real life. People mostly do not change and therefore when they oppose, when they fight, they remain antagonistic until they are killed. So this is uh, you know, an indication that Orestes does not become a murderer because he wants to murder. He only becomes an instrument of that particular period, of that particular time where accepting him there is nobody else who can deliver freedom to the people of Argos. You are too young, too weak. Are you going to draw back now? Hide me somewhere in the palace and lead me tonight to the royal bedchamber and then you will see if I am too weak. So Elector tells Orestes that you are too young and too weak so that Orestes loses confidence and does not proceed in the matter. But this is actually an expression of the lack of confidence in Electra. Orestes. Uh, for the first time you have called me Orestes. So what is the uh, significance of this? That Electra has recognized that Orestes has attained his true being as Orestes. So the dream of Orestes that Electra had, and Orestes would come and with his sword kill the king and the queen, fulfill her revenge, and deliver the people from oppression, that Orestes has actually appeared. So Electra takes cognizance of the change in Orestes from Philebus. So he, uh, she stops calling her Philebus anymore. She calls, uh, calling him Philebus anymore, she calls him Orestes. Yes, I know you now. You are indeed Orestes. I didn't recognize you at first. I had expected somebody quite different. But this throbbing in my blood, this sour taste on my lips, I have had them in my dreams and I, I know what they mean. So at last you have come, Orestes, and your resolve is sure. And here I am beside you, just as in my dreams, on the brink of an act beyond all remedy. And I am frightened. That too was in my dreams. How long I have waited for this moment, dreading and hoping for it. From now on, all the moments will link up like the cogs in a machine and we will never rest again until they both are lying on their backs with faces like crushed mulberries in a pool of blood. So, we see that uh, Electra here becomes like the voice of history and uh, not only history of the future. So she predicts that uh, this moment which she had dreamt earlier was long in preparation and finally it has come to conclusion, come to its uh, crisis, come to its peak and they are going to murder the king and the queen. Now, would you call it determinism? Why does Sartre present the idea 
that the moment was all along being prepared and uh, was in, in a jar form uh, waiting for maturity and finally this moment has appeared. So in this actually we see Sartre's belief I think in dialectics. As a student of Marx or Marxism, Sartre believed that some kind of dialectic operates in history. Forces are in uh, opposition and out of opposing forces something new develops as in the Hegelian dialectic the ideas of thesis, antithesis and synthesis are there. So uh, that is a determinism, that is historical determinism. So we know that Sartre's existentialism is a medley of Nietzsche's nihilism, Marxism and Heidegger and Husserl's thought. So uh, this is how this scene ends and uh, we'll see the next scene is the scene in which the actual murder takes place. So this long scene one, what was its purpose? Its purpose was of course uh, that of exposition, uh, you know, laying down the plot and uh, suggesting future developments, introducing the characters and everything. But also the uh, development of plot and through dialogue, Sartre exposes the two characters, Orestes and Electra, and shows the audience how Orestes changes from Philebus from his lack of purpose to his acquiring of purpose and his final determinism. So we look at scene 2, at the throne room in the palace and there is this statue of Zeus, an awe-inspiring blood smeared image of Zeus occupies a prominent position, the sun is setting. So it begins with the soldiers talking among themselves. We see that they are superstitious, they are afraid that the uh, dead have come out and the uh, dead King Agamemnon, he must have come out and sat on the throne. This raises some humor, but also it uh, creates an ambience for the uh, uh, you know, situation of uh, uh, awe and uh, superstition where people's minds are numbed. So this particular, uh, you know, religious celebration the day of the dead and the idea that the dead are roaming around. So it creates a particular ambience and the soldiers talk of the flies. So why the flies become important? Uh, the flies are, uh, as we will learn later, uh, that the flies are the furies. So the furies uh, become more active when the dead are around, the dead spirits are around and uh, they joke about killing the flies and uh, what would happen if the dead flies also come back. So I suppose that it is Sartre's joke on the whole issue of uh, the dead coming back because if the dead could come back 
then why not the dead flies also? Uh, which indicate that uh, the author does not believe in this whole thing uh, of the dead coming back or uh, the author presents it as a superstition uh, created by Egyptians uh, to keep people in check and uh, fearful. Platonistra asked Egyptians, "What is troubling you tonight?" Page ninety-five. You saw what happened. Had I not played upon their fear, they would have shaken off their remorse in the twinkling of an eye. So the feeling of remorse or guilt has been imposed upon the people by Egyptians, and uh, through these uh, dialogues, Sartre is exposing this fact or laying it bare. that uh, fear remorse guilt uh, all these feelings which have been imposed upon the people uh, the people who are ignorant and superstitious these are engineered by somebody these are engineered by these thieves so that people do not openly rebel against him because these thieves did not Uh, easily have acceptance among the people uh, he became king by murdering the legitimate king so he devises these ways to keep people always under you know uh, always in some kind of fear and anxiety but uh, the people almost started disbelieving uh, the whole thing uh, when Electra uh, refused to believe in that and openly said that that all this mourning and the coming of the dead, all these are nonsense. Platonist, is that all? Then be reassured, you will always find a way to freeze their courage when the need arises. I know, oh, I am only too skillful in the art of false pretence. I am sorry, I had to rebuke Electra. So, this thing operates by false pretence or any king who oppresses people always operates by false pretence. Why? Because she is my daughter. It pleased you to so uh, you to so do, and all you do has my approval. Woman, it is not on your account that I regret it. Then why you use not to have much love for Electra? I am tired, so tired. For fifteen years, I have been upholding the remorse of a whole city, and my arms are aching with the strain. For fifteen years, I have been dressing a part, playing the scaremonger, and the black of my robes has seeped through to my soul. So this is again a revelation. We come to know that Egyptus is tired of his role as the scaremonger. and as zeus would appear we will see that it is zeus who kind of uh prods egyptus in uh making people afraid controlling the controlling them by creating false superstition and particularly uh in the dialogue between zeus and egyptus it would become clear that both of them are in connivance in cheating the people in one basic matter that both of them suppress the fact that men are free so they do not allow people to know that they are free that would that is a very interesting dialogue and we will read today and uh, the only person who knows that he is free is orestes and therefore uh, when zeus tells egyptus that orestes and electra they are plotting against you and you send men to kill them 
when is this to say that you are zeus you are all powerful why don't you strike them down and zeus gives a revealing reply he says that gods have a limitation they can do whatever they want with men as long as men think or men do not know that they are free but anybody who knows that he is free gods cannot do them anything so we will uh, see how sarth presents this whole situation uh, uh, and uh, kind of reveals how operation operates uh, through ideology through false religion or false superstition and here it is to say that he is very tired of his role and uh, that is also uh, significant that the people we think are all powerful they are also not free they are also often under a lot of you know compulsions and it is to feels that he is trapped in this role so in the dialogue between zeus and hesitius we will see that hesitius tells zeus that when uh, i killed agamemnon you prompted me to kill him you didn't stop you didn't stop me and uh, so i found myself in this unenviable position of a murderer or an illegitimate king who must somehow uh, force the people to obey me by fear or other means so it is to transfers or uh, you know, yes a kind of uh, denies that he has any responsibility for his actions so he denies his agency and transfers it to zeus so he complains to zeus that you made me do certain things so you can also stop orestes from killing me but you are not stopping him or you you say that you do not have any power over him so it uh, the purpose of this is to uh, make it clear that there is a difference between a person who is ruled by his uh, drive his desire jealousy and things other things uh, and a person who is free and is not ruled by any such you know uh, overpowering emotion so if we uh, analyze isthus uh, with the help of Freud's, you know, understanding of human mind. Then the desire to murder Agamemnon and to marry Clytemnestra, all these actions could be explained by Aegisthus's instinct or drive for uh, power. sexuality and so on and so forth this uh, instinct or drive or we may say causes which compel man to do something here takes the shape of zeus so we may understand that zeus is not a god but he represents forces which control us so what is the purpose 
of man. The purpose of man is to control these forces so that he can be the master of his action. So to be master of oneself or to be master of one's action is not an easy thing because we are always being propelled by our desire and by various emotions. Therefore we construct theories, we construct ideologies by which we justify our action. So uh, it is still says that uh, uh, when Clytemnestra tries to uh, you know, uh, console him by affectionately uh, trying to kiss him, then it is still stops him by saying that uh, do not do it here, are you not ashamed because somebody will see us. And then uh, Latin minister says that who will see us, nobody is here. Then he says why Agamemnon is here. Then uh, Latin minister says that have you forgotten that you yourself created this you know, story that the dead king comes here and so on. So the purpose of this is to indicate that the maker of an ideology sometimes becomes trapped in his own ideology. So Isistheus is uh, trapped in his own ideology. He has started to believe something that he uh, created, some fiction that he created. So ideology has a grip on everybody including its creator. Then Zeus ap appears and Isistheus complains about his situation. So we see that Isistheus is not happy. He murdered Agamemnon, he got his kingdom, he got his power, he got Clytemnestra. So he got whatever he wanted, but still he is not happy. Not only he keeps uh, everybody in the kingdom unhappy by forcing them to undergo a ritual of mourning, but he also himself remains unhappy. So we may say that this can be you know, understood as a parable that uh, if you uh, try to fulfill your desire by immediately doing what you want to do without thinking of ethical consequences, then you do not find any pleasure from it later. So immediate fulfillment of desire never uh, makes us happy or satisfied. We desire something else. When one desire is fulfilled, then we desire something else. So I will not speak much on this because uh, there are so many Indian uh, thought, so many Indian uh, you know, uh, thinkers have thought about this issue of how to control our desire. In other words, not to be slave to our desire, but to be master of our desire. So here we have a dialogue between Aegisthus and Zeus, uh, which we may also explain as uh, an inner dialogue in Aegisthus himself. Because uh, Zeus is of course fictitious. There is nothing called God. Uh, appearing in a personal form. Uh, so it is a fiction. But for Aegisthus it is true because he believes in this fiction and uh, since both Zeus and Aegisthus are you know, uh, shareholders or we may say uh, equal partners in uh, this crime of oppressing others. Therefore, uh, this dialogue suggests that power always operates uh, through uh, 
conspiracy, uh, secret agreements and so on and so forth. How hideous I am, they cannot like me much. Zeus says, this is still, they fear you. Excellent, I have no use for love. Uh, do you love me? What do you want of me? Have I not paid heavily enough? Never enough. But it is killing me, the task I have undertaken. Come now, don't exaggerate. Your health is none too bad, you are fat. Mind, I am not reproaching you. It is good, royal fat, yellow as tallow, just as it should be. You are built to live another twenty years. So Zeus is mocking. So Zeus is not happy with his life. And Zeus asks him, what is the reason? So you have got everything that you wanted. But Zeus uh, is... is tired of the situation. So you may say that uh, like everybody, Egistius also finds himself in a situation as the uh, existential philosophy uh, theorizes that man finds himself in a situation and uh, he feels trapped in this situation. So how can he free himself from the situation by taking action or by asserting his freedom of choice? Now we see that Egisthus is unable to do it. Therefore, when Orestes comes to kill him, he does not resist. Orestes has come also as he is deliverer. By killing him, Orestes delivers him from this slavery to this system of oppression. So he may be the king, but he is a cog in this machinery of oppression. Thus, Aristheus uh, is not free. Even though he is the king, only Orestes is free. So Sartre makes it clear by presenting Egisthus's uh, difficulties and uh, dissatisfaction uh, of the situation that uh, like everybody else, those who are at the top and those who are uh, powerful even they are not free because they cannot choose otherwise. They do not see their freedom. Their desire, their drives brought them to do something which even if they want to, want not to do or want to stop doing, they cannot do that because they cannot get themselves free. On the other hand, Orestes is free. So Zeus tells uh, Egisthus uh, that Orestes and Electra, they are plotting against him and he should immediately uh, order uh, his uh, police force to arrest, arrest them. But we see that Egisthus opposes this whole idea. He won't send the police to arrest uh, these two. Uh, he changes, he rather uh, charges Zeus that why don't you do it? And uh, he tells him that I will not obey you because by obeying you I have found myself in this situation. I tell you I refuse to fall in line, uh, fall in with your plans. I have done so far too often. So you see that Egisthus here is trying to assert his will against God. Now if we uh, interpret God with uh, you know his own instinct, drive and desire and so on, then it becomes an inner dialogue in Egisthus. He fights against himself, who is the oppressor, 
and for once he does not want to become the oppressor he does not want to send the police and you know uh, arrest them or torture them or kill them so this change in his thoughts is this an idealistic change of heart no for from the very beginning we have seen that it is thoughts wavers even though electra publicly humiliates him he does not take any action against electra so instead of depicting egisthus as a very strong powerful and oppressive ruler sartre depicts him as a person who is shaken and who is oppressed by his own situation who is unhappy with his role as an oppressor who is also in search of freedom and ultimately finds orestes as his deliverer he goes down voluntarily when orestes strikes him he does not oppose him but orestes does not stop for that matter so when he does not oppose him then orestes says okay you want to make me a murderer by not opposing you i do not care you know that will not stop me because it is my mission to rid the people of argos from oppression and that cannot be done without killing you so i'll kill you so orestes is represented as ruthless uh, in the pursuit of his mission and that is the problem with all missionaries you know uh because they believe in some ideology and but here sarth presents orestes not as one who is believing something but one who asserts his freedom or positive freedom positive by by undertaking positive action uh he wants to remove oppression but we see that at every step orestes can be interpreted in two ways so either we can interpret him as a ruthless murderer who is determined to kill two people platonstra and uh, isistius and does not stop killing isistius even though Uh, he does not oppose and platonestra is a woman uh, who can't defend herself yet orestes doesn't stop so all these uh, considerations uh, lead to hesitations in electra but orestes does not have any hesitation why because from the beginning he knows that he has only one role that of delivering the people of argos which cannot be done without killing the two people who are in power isistus and platonestra now we see that in sartre's representation the question of revenge is completely side track Orestes not once Orestes does not speak of revenge even once Electra speaks of her revenge On the other hand Orestes always speaks of delivering the people of Argos from their oppression The for the uh, Greek tragic hero who wanted to take revenge on the murderer of his father he is transformed by sarth into a hero who does not want to take revenge but wants to assert his freedom in favor of you know freedom of others he want to act he wants to act uh, in favor of others freedom by 
removing anything that stands in the way of their freedom. So, once we have this logic, this logic also works in a ruthless manner. If Orestes fails in killing them and granting freedom to the people of Argos, then what happens? Then he proves that there is no freedom. Then he uh, fails in removing the cause of oppression and if that happens then uh, the people remain under oppression and therefore they have no freedom. So Orestes also cannot be free. If other people are not free, then there is no freedom according to existential philosophy. So how do we read Orestes? Does he kill Clytemnestra and uh, his thews because he wants to take revenge? Or does he kill them because he wants to free others? So you see, the, the revenge plot of Greek tragedy that is twisted by Sartre in a complex manner so that it becomes a representation of the idea of existential uh, choice of man. So that choice may involve doing something which is debatable. So if we apply ethics here, then the action of Orestes cannot be fully supported. Because by killing others, you violate the you know, basic human rights and you commit the same mistake that those people committed by murdering Agamemnon. So punishing murder with murder that is a primitive view of, on the other hand, uh, Sartre wants to represent that anything that stands in the way of absolute freedom should be removed and uh, it is the purpose of man to assert his freedom and to commit himself to the cause of freedom. So it becomes an interesting and complex issue uh, and that is why uh, Orestes was accepted by the fascists as a hero. All right. So uh, the interpretation of Sartre is uh, very subtle, we have to understand that in existential philosophy the uh, ordinary ethics cannot be applied, the everyday ethics cannot be applied, but the overall principle of assertion of freedom against oppression, that is the only principle which becomes applicable here.